The Candid Frame is supported by donations by listeners just like you. Help us to bring you great conversations with great photographers. Support the show today with your monthly contribution through our Patreon effort at patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame or click on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. Thank you. This is Ivarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. In my long career in the photo industry, I've had a chance to work with and meet a variety of people. And with many of them, even when my time with them was relatively brief, I came away feeling an appreciation for that person. I often hoped that I'd have the opportunity to spend more time with them and get to know them more. Matt Kluskowski is one of those people. Like you, I met him through his work as one of the Photoshop guys, but I also had the opportunity to interact with him in person, and we'd always talked about having him as a guest on the show. Well, finally, years later, it's finally happened, and I'm glad to say that it was worth the wait. I hope you agree with me. Well, I'm, I'm really excited to finally sit down and talk with you because we've been talking about this for a very long time. <laughs> I know. And since the first time I invited you, your life has changed very, very much. <laughs> yes, it has. <laughs> but, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about before we, because I know you for all the stuff that you do, right? And yeah. all the work that you do. I see you behind the computer yeah. at the desk. I see you at the, you know, at the conferences. And I go, what do I know about this guy? You know, I, and I, I, you know, I see, I've seen a couple of hints. I know you're married. You got a beautiful family. You're into martial arts. You're into being sort of fit. But I was like, what was Matt like when he was a teenager? Was he a, a jock? Was he a geek? Was he in a, some basement in New Jersey playing D and D? Who were you back then? Yeah. You know, I was a, uh, I think I was a kid who struggled to fit in. So yeah. if I were to, if I were to think back, I mean, I, I was always, if I were to give one word to myself back then, it was very, very average ish. Okay. Yeah. You know, never did really good in school. Never did really bad. You know, if I think of like the popular kids and the unpopular kids, you know, it was like, I was always kind of right in the middle, you know, it's yeah. like I could, sometimes the popular kids wanted to talk to me and then sometimes they did it, you know? And so it's, uh, and then, and sports again, I was very, very, I was very average. I, uh, I played, played basketball all through grade school, got to high school. I thought I was okay. And I tried out for the high school freshman team and I didn't make it. And it was like, it was like the first time in my life I ever didn't make anything. So then, uh, so then all the coaches were like, well, you know, the track and field team is looking for people that are in good shape and can run. So I was like, all right, I'll go do track and field. And again, I, you know, I did it and I wasn't really good at it. So I was not a jock. I, I, I was kind of like, I floated through everything, you know, it was, uh, I, 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 I don't know. That's probably the best way I can say it is I floated through different sports and, you know, different groups of friends and everything. So, I mean, I was always a happy kid. I don't remember being unhappy with anything it's just i didn't have any i I had no motivations i had no idea what i was going to do or anything like that Yeah, that was the next thing i was going to ask in terms of having an idea in terms of what you wanted to do so so you just went to school and you just started figuring out what you like to do was that it so from high school to college mine was very driven by uh location i lived in new jersey and oh you know what what i was in into here's one thing i was decent at in in high school and and even some great schools guitar oh okay I took, uh, I studied guitar for about 10 years and I, and then I took two lessons a week from two different instructors for many, many years. <laughs> and, and that was that I would sit in my room and play the guitar for hours and right. hours and hours and scales and theory and all that stuff. But we can come back to that stuff cause it's kind of interesting. I'm, I'm getting back into it. And as a creative person now, I see it in a whole different way. And I, and I, you know, for, for people that listen to this, it's it's kind of been eye opening because I'm seeing things I'm seeing things as a learner now, which is kind of well, interesting. Let's talk about it now because that's kind of okay. what I wanted to learn more about you. Is is, yeah. is you're not a professional photographer. You are an educator. You're quite an accomplice as a photographer. But I was really kind of curious that you know here you are a person who is very creative who but doesn't have to do it professionally. But you're surrounded by people from you know master photographers to people who are just devoted enthusiasts, and it was kind of like. Uh, how does sort of Matt 
find himself fitting in, in, in that world. But let's, let's talk about, you know, the guitar in terms of about, you know, finding an outlet for creativity. Because even though photography is very creative, it can still be work. So, yeah. it's, you know, so it's still important to have that, like we said before, the, that downtime, to have yeah. something else to sort of, you know, keep ourselves nurtured. So to, to talk about how, you know, the guitar has been for that for you lately. So it's it's been interesting because as a kid, I I think I was the a lot of the people that I talk to now. I, I I've kind of identified myself there. There's there's a lot of people in the pro photography workflow post processing area that 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 will follow the the tutorials that I do. But I really try to. I really try to create my stuff for for people with families and jobs and just love photography. Mm-hmm. They're looking for that. They're looking for that creative outlet with photography. Just want to get better, and then maybe maybe sometimes they get the chance at the gig to maybe shoot an event or shoot right. some family portraits for some friends. But for the most part, they're just trying to enjoy photography. But back when I was a kid, because what I see so much is people get bogged down in the tech. Yeah. They got they get bogged down in they get to know their camera, they get to understand apertures and ISO and then sharpening and noise they they understand the tech of all of the stuff, but they have a really hard time going out and making a really cool photo. And as a kid, I was that person with guitar. I understood theory, I understood the scales, I could play the scales up and down the neck any which way possible with my eyes closed to a metronome. Like I could I could master that stuff and the one thing I never got good at was just playing the guitar, just learning some songs, following other people's songs mm-hmm. and just playing and then hopefully starting to infuse the songs I learned with my own style and then build from there. Um, and so as a result, I sat there every day practicing scales and theory and, and all this other stuff. And I got to a point where I felt like, all right, I kind of know it. And then I lost interest. You know, oh. it's like not that not that it's a never and not that I knew everything because I didn't. But I had conquered the things I thought I needed to know, and I lost interest in it, and it kind of faded away because I never, I never got good. I never got as good as the people that I was following. You know, it's like right. I want to be able to do this, but I wasn't doing the things to to get there. No, that and makes so, perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. So here I am, probably what twenty five years later, and. And now, now I'm approaching it from a different angle. So, so I went to uh, I went to Sam Ash Music, which is a guitar store here, here in Tampa. Uh, they're all over the place. I had to get a new microphone for recording videos. And I walk into the store, and then I start poking around the uh, <laughs> the guitar section, and I kind of got the bug again. I still have my old guitars and stuff, so I kind of got the bug again. And I started looking online, and I found this guy who teaches who kind of teaches guitar like I teach photography and Photoshop. He's like, all right, listen, play these notes, play them in this order. Every once in a while, throw this one in there. Don't worry about why. Don't worry about how. Just do it. And I Mm. promise you, it'll sound good. And I'm doing this stuff. And I'm like, I mean, in some ways, I've only been back at it for a few months. And in some ways, I'm better than I was when I was a teenager. I lost a lot of the dexterity and all that stuff, which I have to get back. Yeah, But... I mean, I'm I'm kind of soloing over chord progressions and things like that that as a teenager I could never do. I never figured out how to do that creating part of things because I got I got bogged down in tech. The, the way I see it is that, at, at least for me, I'll speak for myself, is that I didn't get that I was supposed to be playing. You know, yeah. That I would always be so earnest about getting it right because I was so in fear of getting it wrong, about making a mistake and being called mm-hmm. out on it. So I would be like, no, I got to get this thing perfect and I'm not going to take any risk or try to attempt any sort of flourishes. I'm just going to be like paint by the numbers sort of thing and and thinking that that would be enough. And like you, after a while, it's like it's very exhausting to approach anything creatively with that kind of rigidity that it's almost inevitable, inevitable that you just get, okay, I'm done. You know, this is was this guitar too? Was this guitar for you or was it another instrument? It was piano. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I, it was pretty beautiful about, you know, practicing in there, but you know, I just, you know, I, I remember sitting there at the piano trying to get a new piece of music down and really being frustrated that about my mistakes and not sort of just being, Hey, that's just, that's, that's fine. Just keep, just keep playing through. And I'd always yeah. want to start over. 
I remember yeah. that. You know, I'd mess up and I'd start over rather than just going and playing. <laughs> just keep playing. Yeah. Right? And, you know, it's taken me a long time, you know. Uh, to, Do you still to, play? No. No, I wish I, I wish I did. But, you know, it's taken me a while to get to the don't point. Walk into the, don't walk into the piano <laughs> store. <laughs> well, I have a bunch of musician friends. So when I sit down and I hear them play, it's like, oh, wow. You know, yeah. and it's just, but, but, you know, I can appreciate it. But, but the whole idea is just, and I think it's, I think it's why it's, it's really difficult for us as adults, uh, especially photographers, is to remember to play because we get so caught up, at, like you said, in the tech. But I think also it's yeah. about trying to be like, you know, the perfect photographer. And, you know, I, and, and I've it's learned that's going to happen. No, <laughs> no. And, I, and, and the photographers I admire, I see them doing stuff that I would in the past never have considered doing. And I go, God, these pictures are amazing. And then you hear the story behind them and you go, oh, wow, they just just they just did it. You know, they weren't so preoccupied with the outcome. They just went out there and they just dove into the creative process. And then that's where they discovered the good stuff. Those are those are some of my those are some of my favorite people to follow because I love how I love how photographers like that really broke broke the mold of photography. You know, photography was this ancient art of wizardry. You know, yeah. it was just it was very mathematical. You know, I mean, it's very mathematical, um, very very geeky tech heavy. And as as a result, I think you had mostly geeky tech heavy people that kind of ruled that space. And I love, I love when I see, you know, like, I don't, I don't know if you know, uh, you probably, you know, Jeremy Cower. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremy. Um, and I don't know if you know much about his story, but he picked up a camera as a graphic designer and he just started pointing lights because he had an eye for what looked good. And, and I'll, I will take that eye for what looks good any day mm-hmm. over being able to master the tech. Yeah. Um, uh, because he, he did. He had that eye for what looked good, and he could move and he could start to learn and figure it out. And and back in the the real, you know, the, back in the, you know, 30 years ago, that would have been really difficult to do. It would have been difficult to learn because you didn't have that instant feedback of, I'm pointing a light click, I can see it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it would have been difficult to do 30 years ago. But because of digital, because of where things have come, because of how easy cameras are to use, because of how good the sensors are at capturing everything and post-processing, I think you, you can now get this whole different group of people in yeah. that, that can – totally break the mold of what would have existed 20, 30 years ago. And you get this whole, and they can be creative and they can live from a creative standpoint rather than trying to worry about numbers and different things like that. So how do you encourage people to do that? Because in your, in your workshops and in, in, in your lessons, you're, you're teaching people largely technical stuff. Mm-hmm. So how do you sort of encourage people to go, yeah, learn the technical stuff, learn, you know, how to work with Lightroom or with Photoshop or with on one, whatever application you're using. But how do you sort of encourage people to say, OK, play, have fun, uh, take some risks? Yeah, I mean, I think it's two ways. I think I think one, you have to I think one, it's it's do it. It's stop watching videos on it. Stop reading books on it. Stop futzing around with your camera sitting in your office and go out and do it. Just like sometimes I, I have I have to kick my again, I'll I'll take it back to picking up the guitar again. You know, sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm sitting on my iPad and I got my headphones on and I'm watching video after video after video and I might do that for an hour and I'm like, you know what? I didn't play a freaking thing today. Mm. And so I, I have to force myself sometimes because it's not it's it's not like it's f- not fun. I mean, sometimes it's fun to watch these videos and do those things, but I have to force myself to get up and pick it up and play because that, it's not it's not until you get better. So I think the same concept is is you know, the obvious is you have to get out and shoot. You're never ever 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 going to get back uh, get better at it if you don't get out and do it. And then the other thing I try to do is I try to teach people the stuff. I, I spend a lot of time trying to figure out what tripped me up and and more than just, all right, I've learned that if I place a, uh, you know, let's say landscape photography, I've learned that if I place a foreground object here, this works. Mm-hmm. But if I want to be an educator and not a photographer, which I do, you know, I, I want I want to be educator first. I've got to figure out why does placing why does placing that there work for the picture right. and how do I explain this to other people 
So, so I, it can't just be enough that I know it because I'm, I'm, again, I'm not trying to be a photographer. So I've got to figure out why does this work there and how do I explain it to people? So I, I, I guess I probably spend a lot of time trying to figure out like to tell people, okay, you know, backlight something, you got a group of flowers, put, stand there so that the sun's behind them and then move around so that there's a dark tree or a dark hill or a dark shadow behind them so that those flowers glow. Here's why. There's something bright behind them. You'll never see the glow because the glow will be washed away by all the brightness. Like figuring out little things like that, that, that I didn't know when I started and I had to figure out, you know? Well, that's, that's a sign of a good teacher that the teacher gives you context. Cause I think there are a lot of people out there that teach a lot of things, including photography. And they'll just tell you, this is how you do it. And I'm not going to tell you why this, you, this is just the way you do it. Yeah. You know, and this is the way you do it. Right. And Instead of just saying, like you're saying, you know, here's an approach. Here's the reason why I think it works. Here's a, re- you know, here's some examples as to why it doesn't work. Yeah. So that when people go out there and they see those scenes, they can relate that information to what they're seeing with their naked eye. Because otherwise, yeah. you can teach all these people and tell them that these are the rules. Yet they go out there and they look at the world and they don't know where to start. Yep. And and you know and I. <sighs> And I think part of it is, I think part of it is, is sometimes, sometimes being able to, I guess, maybe explain it. You know, it, it's, it's, I, I wasn't born creative. I, I, I was not like, you know, we, we taught you, I mean, it was, it's actually a great segue because if you talk to anybody who knew me in high school, the last <laughs> thing they would have told you was I was a creative person that they ever expected me to be creative, which is interesting because people will watch some of my editing tutorials and they're like, Oh my God, you're so creative. How'd you, how'd you learn to do that? And I'm like, I learned, it's a very learned trait. I did not know it. And I learned it by following people, asking questions and, and really sitting down and thinking about the, the why stuff a lot. But it did, none of this stuff came to me naturally. The, the most frustrating term in photography for me was it's all about the light hmm. because I don't see the light. So I have to be told this light's good. And when you tell me this light's good, I can remember it and I can recognize it. And then I know I should go shoot that light over and over again, you know, <laughs> which is all I do. That's all I do. I, I didn't know it was good. I didn't know I should be out shooting landscapes at sunrise or sunset until somebody told me. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, so now I know this is good. I know what this good looks like. I'll keep trying to repeat that. It's kind of interesting because, you know, when you you started teaching, when you started you know, working for Kelby, but it seems like yeah. at the same time you were developing your skills as a creative artist with photography and Photoshop. And at the same time, you're learning how to teach. Yeah. So it's like you're doing I those things in parallel. <laughs> <I suck laughs> so bad. Back why, why were you so bad? I was new. I mean, I just it. I, I don't know. I just sucked. I, you know, I, it, it's kind of interesting. I mean, th- there I was 15 years later and I was probably, yeah, this is a cool conversation because you, you started it out in a, in a way that I've never really started out. There I was 15 years later trying to fit in, trying to find my voice oh, Yeah. in this, in this sea of educators that were so much better than me. You know, it's like, I think I think I was just right place at the right time it, when you know I lived in Tampa. I knew some people at Kelby. They were looking for somebody full time. A couple of people said, "Hey, we know this guy Matt. He writes for the magazine." I yeah. walk in. They're like, "Oh, right, let's give it a try," you know. But I was I, I was mediocre at best. And then you walk in. You got Scott Kelby there. You got Dave Cross. And then I'm thrown into Photoshop world with you know Deke McClellan and yeah. Ben Wilmore and Burt Monroy and all these all these really amazing. Uh, educators out there and I was trying to find my voice I still remember I'm, I'm going to admit something I don't know if I admitted before I would listen to Dave Cross's videos mm-hmm. and then I would try to do my videos like well hello everybody we're going to start on the <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and I listened back and realized nobody's Dave Cross only Dave yeah. can pull Dave off and Dave sounds good Dave is a very deep I don't know. He's Dave has a teaching style to him yeah. that works to him. When I did it, I was boring. When Dave does it, he's engaging. Yeah, you know? um, yeah. Dave so is, that, you know, it was just weird, but I was I was struggling to find my voice, and 
And uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 the only way I got better was I, I it was tough. I asked people. Uh, I would yeah. finish a class. Bingo. Yeah. I would finish a class. This is the honest God truth. I would finish a class and I would find somebody I knew in that class. And it had to be somebody I trusted that wanted to see me get better because not everybody can give you good feedback, you know? And I would find somebody I knew in the class and I would ask them, I'd be like, all right, tell me how I did. And dude, (laughs) it was, it was brutal. (laughs) <laughs> it was really, really tough. I would leave my first Photoshop world because I think Scott gave me classes just because I worked there and just, you know, to make me feel good. Um, I would I would leave my classes. I would go to the moderator in the back of the class. I would get all the evaluations and I would read them right away. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> because I, I wanted to know, like, where what could I improve on? You know, yeah. it's like, hey, if I read these now, I can figure out what I screwed up. And by my next class... Maybe I can do better. Maybe I can have that. Uh, uh, you know, if, if I'm missing something here or there, I can figure that out. So that's a brutal way to learn, though. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was really, really brutal. <laughs> yeah, because I I so relate to that. But the mistake that I made for the longest time is I didn't ask anybody because I didn't yeah. want anybody to know that I didn't know what the f I was doing. You know. Yeah. And now I know how big of a mistake that was. How I could have saved myself a lot of grief. And probably, you know, a lot of people who are listening to me, a lot of fumbles, yeah. if I just said, okay, just like you, what did I do wrong? What did I do right? How can I make it better? But- well, I, would say, I was going to ask you back, like, you know, what did you do? Because you, I, I've never known you to not be well-spoken and, and engaging. So, you know. I- oh, yeah. I, you know, I think for me, it was, I was always very hyper self-conscious. So one mm-hmm. of the things is I was always, uh, always wanting to fit in. And never ever feeling like I could. I mean, I I can't, I don't do small talk well. Yeah. Right. And you know, you get into those social circles, and I would just be in my head so much that I would just <laughs> be on the periphery. I would just go to the food table. You know, I would get really? in the corner. Yeah. I just wouldn't. I would try to get into a conversation, and it just felt like I just didn't know how to do sort of small talk. But what it did do is that I was very observant. I was taking in people. I was listening yeah. to people. Um, and that ended up sort of helping me with respect to interviewing people. And when I wrote magazine articles and now with the show is because uh, I was so observant and I was always listening that when it came time for me to start interviewing people, it just came sort of natural to me. And now yeah. I feel a little more comfortable in social circles. And now sometimes if, it's, if it, I'm having really trouble, I'll start interviewing people. But they don't know I'm interviewing them, you well, know. But, I mean, people love to people love to answer questions about themselves, right? You know, I mean, that's just like whether you whether you you went down that path of knowing that's what you're doing. I I mean, I think at the end of the day, everybody loves to talk about, talk about themselves. About and and honestly, sometimes I'm I'm that way in 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 a social circle. I don't you know I I like to watch sports. Like I'll sit down on, on Sunday and watch football, and I kind of know what's going on, but I, I don't. I couldn't tell you who was drafted last week for the Tampa Bay Bucks or anything like that, you know. So if they're talking sports. I don't know, to know, but but one of the things I do is probably very similar to you. Is I start interviewing them, like so so so. What's your favorite team? Did you go to school there? You like, you know, yeah. I kind of just start asking people about about themselves, and and that usually kind of helps me out. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't help that I didn't drink. So it's like everyone used sort of the liquid courage to get them in the conversation yeah. and I'd be the sober one there. Which... <laughs> but, but tell me how about how you got into landscape, landscape photography. How did you get into exploring the outdoors? So, I mean, speaking of talking about ourselves, this is actually probably one of my favorite stories to tell because I guess I always, I always hope that other people fell into this. Um, so here I am working at Kelby. And, you know, part of my job is not only to teach, but to get other people in there to teach and to help them with their classes and the format that we used and everything. So, you know, imagine imagine every week you have some great photographer walking in that's going to do classes. Mm -hmm. And and, you know, I always take them out to lunch or dinner or whatever. And I would always I kind of always enjoyed like getting to talk to him and, and, and find out a little bit more about it. But. So here, here you are in this mass of, of educational business, right? 
you've got Scott, you've got, you know, Scott, the owner of the company, but then you've got all these other people that you work with and all the, all these other educators and you feel whether it's imposed personally or not, you feel like, man, I got to be really good at something. And I've, I've got to like, I've got to find something, you know, so something I can do and stand out. I got to be able to hang as a photographer because all these other people are, are awesome, you know? So you got a wedding photographer coming in. I'm thinking, oh, you know what? I mean, hey, we'll go shoot a couple weddings, you know? So I hit up a couple of friends that are wedding photographers. Hey, can I come assist, you know? And, uh, and a portrait photographer. So, you know, outdoor portraits, you got Joe McNally walking in, who's you know, doing all these things on the beach and lighting people and all. I'm like, I'm going to bring some flashes out to the beach and do this stuff and studio work, landscape, nature, wildlife, airplanes, cars. You, I mean, you name it. So all these people are coming in and I'm struggling to like to find what to do. You know, I'm, I'm going all over the place. And as a result, I'm not getting anywhere. Yeah. One of the things a friend of mine, Bill Fortney, who's a a wonderful, very, very talented and educator and landscape photographer, asked me to do to go along and co-teach some workshops years ago. And uh, and so I kind of went along as the post processing guy. He had photographers that would take people out into the field. I would go along, I'd shoot and then we'd go back to the class and I'd show them how to edit the photos that they had just taken. Okay. And that when when I really sat down one day and I started thinking like, all right, I, I'm tired of this, you know. I'm I, I I feel bad like people are giving me studio lighting DVDs, other instructors, and I'm not watching them because I just I'm not motivated to. Yeah. And uh, and I started thinking like, what do I really like? And the landscape photography is what got me out of bed in the morning, literally and figuratively. I would look forward to it. like I couldn't sleep the night before, and I never felt that way in any other genre of photography. You know, I never, I never got that like, wow, I, I, like, I can't wait to get up and go shoot, you know? And, um, and, and just driving around and like, I'll be driving through my neighborhood and there's really virtually nothing for me to pull my camera out in my neighbor, maybe some birds, but I still can't keep my eye off of the sky and light and everything when it's happening, you know, cause it's just, I, I like it, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's kind of, that, that was really my, you know, I started looking at what am I best at? And I started looking at what do I like to do the most? And, um, and that, that was landscapes and outdoor. And so that's kind of how I, I got into that. Well, what was the appeal about it? What, what was it about doing that kind of photography that excited you? <sighs> um, I think I liked, I liked a little bit of the number one. I think it's, I think it's one of the most approachable for people. So probably I probably fell into that too, because I don't need to know how to direct people. I don't need to know how to pose people. I don't even need to know how to talk to people. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I wasn't talking to people because yeah. I was out there shooting and, and shooting in groups, but I, I didn't have to know all this other stuff, you know? And again, I, may, I think maybe it fell into that list of I can, I can figure this out, you know? I, I always loved the outdoors. I, you know, I like traveling to some of those places and, and getting to see them and, um, so I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's weird. It's uh, like I'm not one of those guys like it spoke to me, you know, but it just I don't admit, I think probably part of it was is I kind of realized I was OK at it, too. Like it's the only yeah. part of photography I felt like I was good at. And so maybe that hooked me into it as well. Oh, yeah. When you see yourself getting better and you see a, you see your yeah. the best part of you reaffirmed in, in what you're doing, it's 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 and really the, encouraging. And the other thing, because I mean, because so, that question kind of throws me for a loop because I actually don't know how to answer it. Like, what do I really like about it? But what I know is, is when I think back to the magazines and when I think back to what inspired me about photography, it was always a landscape. It was always there was always some outdoor scene or of some sort of nature that inspired me to get into photography. Well, I didn't even know it, you know, but that was it was always a landscape. And I, when I was working at Nikon, uh I would see these pictures, you know, people taking, and I just, for me, they weren't making an impression. I was just like, why do people buy all these expensive camera equipment to take pictures of rocks, right? (laughs) (laughs) That's the way I looked at it. Yeah. And then I went out with a friend of mine, Don Gale, who sadly passed away some years ago. And it was just like, it was revelatory. It was just like, oh, wow. All the stuff that I thought about in terms of light and shadow, in terms of composition, he was teaching me how to, to see everything in that way and it just gave me mad respect even when i was working outdoor photographer he was like i got to start interviewing all these all yeah. these photographers and really learning 
what's involved in really being able to to do this at a really exceptional level, you know. And yeah. this is back and this is back when people were still shooting film. This was just people just getting into digital before people had the advantage of Photoshop and Lightroom in order to be able to enhance oh, those yeah. pictures. These are people who were shooting stuff in Chrome, right? And it was you know, a lot harder back then. <laughs> <laughs> but for for you, you know, getting back to the how we talked about, you know, when you were learning to play guitar and how you were very sort of, you know, for, if not formulaic, but being very rigid in terms of your process of learning the guitar. So how how did you approach photography differently, especially since you were working in the age of digital where you not only were capturing digitally, but you had the ability to enhance the pictures in, in, in the computer? How did you sort of keep that sort of playfulness as part of your your process, you know, developing as, as an artist rather than falling back into the rigidity that made you fall out of playing guitar? Yeah. I mean, I think I think part of it was was starting to doing it more. Number one, that that helped tremendously. So uh, one of the things, and I, I was I was lucky in this aspect. I was traveling a lot for for where I worked, so I would always tack on a day or two to a trip, and I'd find some place to go shoot. So so that helped a lot because I was I was getting out to a lot of different places. You know, it was whether it was a beach or forest or trees or mountains or, or whatever it was, but I. I would get to to throw on that day or two to the trip and go out and experience something new, which kept me moving along. Right. You know, it kept me kept me not sitting there. You know, if we were talking guitar speak, reading scales and practicing in my office. Um, you know, kept me not kept me not looking on sitting on the computer looking at noise and sharpness and wondering you know <laughs> yeah. what sharpening slider I should use. Um, and it got me out. You know, practicing how to make sharp photos, and that was. You know, I found that much more rewarding. So I think a lot of it was getting out there and almost what we talked about before, you know, getting out there and doing it, <laughs> being able to actually practice it and then uh, and, and seeing the results of it. So who, you talked about when you were teaching, you would solicit the feedback of people who you trusted to give you feedback in terms of your teaching. Yeah. Who did you turn to when it came to your photography? Um, you know, so on the on the photography level, um, Bill Fortney, who I mentioned earlier, uh, I always I always trusted Bill to give me an honest an honest critique of my photos. Um, I have another photographer. Uh, you probably knew Chris Orwig. Chris, yeah, you know Chris. So Chris, uh, an amazing guy, um, and I always I always trusted Chris to to give me an honest an honest critique of my photos. And honestly, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Th- those are the only two guys I ever really went to. Um, it's weird. It, it's, and then, and then the other thing is, is, is my wife and my family. Cause you know what? They're going to tell me, <laughs> I, I kind of want to know, I, I want to know how my photos resonate with everybody else out there in the world. I don't, I don't really, I don't really, I, this sounds bad and I don't, I don't mean it to sound as bad as it sounds. I, I don't, not too worried about how my photos resonate with other photographers that I'm teaching at, at these conferences here and there. Cause if you play that game, you'll never, you'll never oh, catch yeah. up. You know, that's an impossible game to play. And I don't even mean it in a, I don't mean it in a bad way. It's just there, there's competition in every industry, you know? So, so I, I don't really try to impress the photographers that I teach with at these conferences. I, I want to know, want to share my, my photos with other people. So my wife and my family are, like I said, they're going to tell me because to them, it's just like, oh, there's dad with his camera again, you know? And, and so they'll give me a good, you know, my wife will look at something. She'll be like, eh, I don't like it. I'm like, really? Do you know where I was? Do you know how early I got up to take that photo? Do you understand how beautiful the light is? She's like, yeah, I don't know. I just don't like it. Yeah. Oh, well, that so. speaks to one of the perils of being around a bunch of photographers is that you you put so much weight on their opinions. Yeah, you know, and it's like some people who aren't photographers are probably the, the best people to turn to to have them, you know, say something about your 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 photography. You know, beyond you know your mom who's going to just love everything, but <laughs> you know, but finding people yeah. who you can whose whose opinions you you trust even if they don't have sort of the the vocabulary to be able to yeah. say oh it's the you know the tonality here is wonderful and i love yeah. the, all that other you know all that other baggage and it's it just reminds me how important it is to have 
a circle of people that you trust and you can rely on, you know, for feedback for anything that you do. It's, uh, you know, you, you, I mean, the, the, you hear this saying in so many industries, but, you know, how many photographers does it take to screw in a light bulb? One to screw it in, 99 to say, I could have done that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and that, that's really what it is, you know. Yeah. It's, you know, I, I just encourage people. It's okay. I, I love, I, I, want, I want everybody to share their stuff. Go on Facebook, go on Instagram, Instagram share, share away, but don't get caught up in the, don't get caught up in the, well, you know, I think the shadow there is too strong or whatever. That's, you know, oftentimes you can't, you can't follow that stuff because it's, it's a never ending battle. Well, you're, you're in the, you're in an unusual position in which people will come up to you soliciting your opinion and your advice and going, Hey, can you take a look at my work? And you know, how do yeah. you sort of, you know, decide how you're going to uh, approach them? Cause some of these people you don't know, right? And you, yeah. you know, some people, you know, and you know, I can be, very, I can be brutally honest. There are other people I need to be very, you know, very careful with. But when you don't know somebody, how do you sort of how, you know, especially when you go to Photoshop World or other workshops or people who really are who see you feel like that they know you feel like they can trust you. And yet they're asking for as honest an opinion as they believe that they can take with respect to the work. <sighs> That's a good one. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I have sort of a formula, which is I think the formula for for most critiquing things. And that is, you know. I look at it, I'll talk about what's working, and then I'll talk about what's not working. Mm -hmm. And and some you know, and that balance will change for each photo. So as you know, you look at something and you say, Okay, this is for me, this is what's working, this is what's hitting me. You know, I like this, I like this, I like this. And sometimes that what's working conversation goes on for a long time about the photo. What's not working, uh, you know what, there's a little thing in the corner. I bet you if you just crop that out, it'd be strong, whatever, you know, and then sometimes it flips, you know, sometimes it's, all right, what's working is I love your shutter speed for the water, you know, nice and smooth looks good. What's not working is there's, you know, you're out at 12 noon. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, it, it's not a pretty, you know, that there's a tree hanging over, there's branches hanging, you know, there's all these, so sometimes it just flips, but I mean, I always try to do it and start with, you know, okay, here's what's working. Here's what's not working. Here's what we can do the next time you're out, you know, yeah. and and I, and I always kind of leave people with if I could order up the perfect version of this the next time you're out shooting. And I understand you may actually never be at this location again, but when you're at someplace similar, let's look for these things. Right. You know, but it's uh, it's it's it, I, I enjoy it. But, uh, you know, it's you, I, I you know what I think I, I, I leave with. I never I never, ever want to make somebody like and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for people that are just doing this because they love it. Right. It kind of changes a little bit. If this is going to be your business, sometimes you have to put put your uh, sometimes you have to you know put the big boy pants on and, and, and really really take it if, you, if you're going to get better at your business especially if it's a business that affects other people's lives you know yeah. you don't want a wedding photographer people telling you you're awesome you're awesome you're awesome and you're not and you go out and you ruin somebody's wedding day photos because of it so this is all for people that love it but it if I could tell an interesting side story so yeah, I was at Photoshop world and a person had come up to me and he said, can you, will you take a look at my photos? And I said, sure. So we sat down and looked at him and my, my jaw dropped. I'm like, dude, this stuff is beautiful. Like seriously, he, he showed me 30 photos. I would have put 29 of them into my portfolio any day. They were, mm. they were all mostly outdoor. He, uh, beachy islandish type things. And uh, I'm like, wow, man. I'm like, I, I put anything, anything from this. And he's like, that's interesting. He's like, you know, I had a, uh, he's like, I had another photographer tell me that, um, you know, in, in a very harsh way that they were just vacation photos. <laughs> and he's like, and I was really feeling bad about myself. He's like, I, he, he actually, own, he co-owns a gallery with his son um, I won't give out too much information, but he co-owns a gallery with his son and he sells the crap out of these photos. <laughs> so in the meantime, I mean, you know, 
personally, he's doing well. He's he's taking pictures of what he likes, but financially, he owns a gallery in a very touristy type of an area where he's able to convert on it and make money. And oh. somebody t- basically told him, was like, no, you got to stop shooting this stuff because you're just taking vacation photos. But wow. he he loved what he was shooting, too. And you could see it. You could see like it wasn't just a bit. It wasn't he stood on a beach and went click. You know, there was a mm-hmm. swing coming off of a, a palm tree in the in, in the that 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 framed a beautiful sunset like there was a lot of thought that went into these photos they weren't just vacation snapshots that didn't have anything behind them the stuff that excites me when i have a chance to take a look at somebody's work is always the stuff that is just that people are in love with and you can yeah. see it in the photographs and you go yeah. cuz i've seen and you've seen images that are technically perfect but leave you hollow you know, yeah. they all look beautifully photoshopped and shot and printed. And you know that there's a lot of attention to detail with the mechanics of all that. But you're just left like going, good work. And then there are other people, <laughs> you see that first yeah. image and then you see the second one and the third one and you're going, yeah. damn, you yeah. know. And that was this guy, you know, it's yeah. like they might he I think he was giving people a way to take their vacation home with them. You know, he was showing Uh, these people the experiences that they experienced, but in a beautiful photo that they could take home with them. So, you know, it was this. uh, But he was however it was put to him, it was it was put to him in, I guess, kind of a harsh way because he was pretty down on it. He was kind of feeling like, man, I thought I was a pretty decent photographer and I've just been told that I'm not and that really everything I shoot is not worthy. Was a, I, I felt a super nice guy. That was uh, it was uh, was was one of my favorite moments of Photoshop world, like favorite conversations. So, what are you doing to keep busy busy now? I know you left. How is it? Three years now that you were left, Kelby, or is it? It's, yeah, it's go probably going on three years. Um, I went to work at on one for a little over a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was where I went straight after Kelby. Um, in, in my time there, I, I got to do some really neat things. But I also, you know, when I was at Kelby, I thought. It might be it might be time to move on to something else. I knew I still wanted to be in education, but the software aspect of it seemed kind of neat, too. So maybe to merge the two of them. Um, And then during that time there, I kind of realized, you know what, I'm I'm an educator. Like I need to be maybe out there teaching, teaching for my job and not not necessarily being in meetings having to talk about the software and right. test things and do the things like that. I, I'm the kind of guy, like I, I've realized this about myself. I, I, I shouldn't work for any software company. I'm the kind of guy that give it to me. I'll figure out how to use it, but I can't tell you how to make it better. Ah, okay. <laughs> and, I've, and I've really come to realize that about myself over the years. It's like, I'll use anything you put in my hands and I'll figure out and I'll figure out a way to teach people how to use it. But I, uh, I, I don't know that I have the vision that some people have to make something better, to gotcha. make a, a piece of software better, um, which is fine because I love teaching. That's that's really like that's my favorite thing. So, um, so yeah. So uh, last year, my wife and I, um, she worked for kind of a little subsidiary of On One that had a magazine, a uh, Photoshop Elements magazine, and uh, so she was kind of in the industry. She edited, she did the marketing, she did the email list, she did all the business stuff that I okay. don't do. So yeah, last year we decided to let's let's go and make a go of this on our own over at mattk.com. Oh, awesome, awesome! So what can we, so, so when people go there, what, what can they expect to find there? Um, so it's my uh, it's kind of it's it's the hub. It's got my you know my blog and my portfolio, my workshops, um, and what I did is is I kind of I kind of picked apart two big areas. I did a big last fall. I did a big Lightroom course. Um, and then I just did one called the Photoshop system. And so the ideas, the ideas were, I've seen, and I've seen and been part of a lot of a lot of training in both Lightroom and Photoshop. And what happens is that you come up with a training course, and then a few weeks later, oh, I got another idea for a course. And then a few weeks later, I got another idea for a course. And then a few weeks later, somebody else has an idea and comes in and does a course. And and what you end up with is a, a lot of great training from some very talented people, but it's also hard to find a start to finish Mm -hmm. because none of those courses were created in a cohesive way with knowledge of each other, you know, if that, if that makes sense. So, so what I set out to do is like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to make 
a Lightroom, it's more of a system to learn Lightroom. It's like 15 courses in one. I did the same thing for Photoshop. It's like little mini courses that all culminate to a system to learn Lightroom and Photoshop. So, Are you, so uh, yeah. So if now you go over to the website, you'll find those. So now yeah. that you have running sort of your own your own shop. Are you finding it more difficult to find the time to go out and just, like you said, going out and play with the camera and, and making your yes? Shots? So how are you <laughs> yes. how are you dealing with that? How are you how are you making sure that you find some time to be able to do that? Uh, uh, booking trips that I have to go on. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, if I leave it to just walking around outside the house, it's like you know what I'll just end up working late that day mm-hmm. and then. The kids will come home and we'll want to do something and spend some, you know, it's it, so, um, it's, uh, you know, trying to book a trip to, to, to get somewhere and, you know, go teach somewhere and then, and then put some photography onto it. Um, and it, it is a little bit easier it's because I do work from home. Yeah. It's part of my job. I, I have to. So it's like, you know what, if I have to take off early one day, spend a little bit of time with the, the kids, you know, three, four, five o'clock, and then head out to go shoot sunset somewhere. Um, then it's not a bad thing. You know, it's some just kind of jiggling time around in different times of the day. So, and how old yeah, are your kids? Just, uh, I have a 15 year old and then my, uh, other son, he'll be 14 in a couple of oh, weeks. Teenagers. teenagers. Two boys. So, how like, about you? No, no kids. No kids. Just, just a dog. <laughs> <laughs> they want a dog. I, I'm like, you guys, you guys won't be able to take care of a dog. You know what'll happen? They'll get the dog. They'll walk it for two weeks. And then for the rest of the dog's life, I'll be the one waking yeah. up at five 30 to take the dog. You'll have to put the dog on your schedule. <laughs> Well, the last question that I ask each guest is that I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that photographer be and why? Uh, you know, I'm going to go with uh, the gentleman I said before, which is Chris Orwig. Okay. Why? So I don't know that I, I mean, gosh, I don't, I hate to say it. He, he's just so passionate. I was going to say, I don't know that I've ever seen anybody as passionate about, but this guy is, he's just so into it. Um, and he sees it on a whole different level. And, and he's such an interesting person for me to talk to because he makes me see things on a way different level than, yeah. than I see it. He, he, you know, we we're the, we're the kind of people we don't talk, but maybe, you know, four or five, six times a year. We, we might not even see each other once a year, but it's like when we get together and we start talking, it just starts firing away, you know, and, and he does, he challenges me. He makes me think, um, he shoots things. He he shoots mostly people, but he photographs people in such a thoughtful way. Yeah. And when you, when you look at his work, you, you can, you can, if you start to look through his portfolio, you will recognize a Chris Orwig photo. He photographs in such an interesting way he gets to know his subjects in such an interesting way. And then his post-processing style is, is again, just, it's, it's, it's perfect to me. You know, I look at his stuff, I'm like, man, like if I got into portrait photography, like that's what I, that's the kind of yeah. stuff that I'd want to do. Yeah. He's a photographer philosopher. Yes, I mean, yes, yes. Yeah. You know, Chris, oh, yeah. so. Well, man. So what about you? What are, what are you shooting these days? I'm going to throw it back on you. Oh, well, I, I usually don't talk about myself on the show, but um, I'm doing. I've always done my street photography, so yeah. from the very beginning, that's what I, uh, that's what I've done. Uh, I've been incre- This year was the year that my wife said, "Don't do anything else." just focus on the show. So I've been focusing primarily on, on the show, but mm-hmm. you know, in order to bring in money, I've been doing portraits and, and weddings, you know, cause it's just like, I, I don't feel comfortable with just relying on the show in and of itself to yeah. bring in income. Cause it's not bringing in, you know, any, any reasonable income for me to support my household. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I'm doing all this other work, but I, I stopped doing the magazine article writing. I stopped teaching as an adjunct at the art center college of design. And I've just been focusing on the show and doing whatever portrait and wedding work that I can get. And then I've been teaching workshops. Um, mm-hmm. I teach several through the Los Angeles center of photography. And then I do some one-on-ones in, in Los Angeles. Um, so that's been, that's been sort of what's been, because what, what, what had happened with me is that I left Outdoor Photographer and Digital Photo Pro about, uh, it's going on 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And then I was working freelance. So I was writing magazine articles for Shutterbug, for Rangefinder, for whoever would have me. 
And I was just, I was all over the place. I was one of those guys yeah. who I felt like I couldn't say no to anything because oh, I yeah, needed yeah. to, because I, I got to bring in, I got to bring in money. But at some point I was just getting so fatigued because I was just all over the place yeah. and not feeling like I was making much of any progress. And I was saying yes to work that I really didn't want to do because mm-hmm. I felt like I need the money. I don't, because, you know, the life of a freelancer is like one month can be great. And then the next month you're waiting by the mailbox yeah. for a check. Especially with, the, with all the articles, you know, they take, they take a lot of time and energy. Yeah. But if, if you're, you know, I, I, like I can, I could just tell by, you know, just watching you and listening to you and, and reading from you that, you, you also can't say no because you feel like it's such a great opportunity. Like these are such great magazines or great, we, we, all, we all know the people in the industry that work right. for them and you're like, oh yeah, I want to do that. It all sounds great until the deadline. <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> oh no. And the last thing you want to do is write a magazine article when you don't have a great idea. You don't want to be forced to just come up with a idea, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I've been doing and I had been doing that for eight years. So for me, it was like, you know, it was something that I was good at and I could get that work. And then I was writing books. I wrote like five books. I remember, yeah. You know, so, but it was just and like. that is, that <sighs> is, that will take a lot out of yeah, you. Yeah, and after that <laughs> last book, I was like, I got to take a break. And it's been like two, two and a half years since I've written a book. And I want to write another book, but I'm just been, and I sent in a proposal, but they didn't get brought into because uh, they just didn't think that they could fit in with my idea with the, with the market. Mm-hmm. But I'd like to do another book, but I definitely want it not to be on something that I really would love to write about. Self-publish it. Yeah, but it's like, for me right now, it's just like, I, I, yeah. I, I can't get into writing a book because I got so much I'm trying to so, do already. So Are you doing, or so are you getting to do street photography much? Yeah, yeah. I don't get to do it with the regularity, but I'm always with my camera. And Do you li- find it's harder or easier now? Oh, it's easier. It's easier because I can find, all, all I need to do is get out the door. And I can but go like, anywhere and make the photographs. Act of it. I, I, I guess maybe the act of it, like getting out there and how the street and the people respond to a photographer. It was, I, I, and I asked this because it seemed like street for it seemed like street photography. It, it had, it had its point where it was like, it was widely accepted. Mm-hmm. And then, and then it seemed like we went, to a place where people on the street with a camera were bad. And now, and then maybe you never experienced it, but just, it, you know, and I, and I never did it a lot, but yeah. I just, I, I guess I saw in the times I did do it and the times I, I, I would watch, I'd sometimes see like, you know, it became the guy with the camera was maybe bad. If he's pointing his camera at you, then something bad's going to, you know. Um, and I'm wondering if, if that has changed a little bit, you know, so with phones and, and whatnot. Yeah, I think people are more aware of it. But just with my approach and the way that I teach people, um, I, I don't experience that. Because what I do is I establish my presence like on a street corner because I like corners. Because I'm uh-huh. getting people left from the right sort of converging, and that can be really interesting. But people see me standing there at that corner making photographs, mm-hmm. not, not, not aware that I'm seeing him from 50 yards away or 25 gotcha. yards away. And I'm like going, okay, that person would be good if I can get them in the right space and the right light and I get this person from the left. So I'm already there making pictures. So all of a sudden, I've established my presence there. So they yeah. don't think that I'm there to make a photograph of them. Right. So I'm, I'm constantly looking at all these different things that are changing, that are just like transforming yeah. on the street and all these players, all these casts of characters and how they might play a role in, in my photograph. I'm not Bruce Gilden where I'm going up to somebody with a flash and, <laughs> and, but you know, because of the way that I shoot, I can get pretty close and I can actually step into somebody's way and make a shot and then keep moving. And they just either, um, they're completely oblivious or more than likely they just don't care. Yeah. Right. They're just intent on getting to where they want to, to get. And, you know, people, every time I, I uh, teach a workshop and we take it out to the street, I show them. It's like, and I force them to say, get in the middle of the sidewalk and let people come to you and then sort of jockey around them. And you'll just see most people will just will look, they'll walk past you and they may look back at you, you know, and try to huh. figure what was that about? But then they'll just go, those just go on. So it's very rare that I have people stopping me or asking me what I'm doing or get angry about it. Because it's like, I was here before you were. You're on my street. So I think yeah. that, 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 that whole concept in sort of, oh, he's supposed to be there. 
doing what he's doing sort of That's interesting. diffuses any potential yeah. conflict that I might have with anybody that I end up photographing on the street. That's just the way it works for me. Yeah. I, and I ask cause I, it, you know, it's, it's something that I, I've never, I've never felt totally comfortable with. So it's well, like, I, I would like to feel more comfortable with it, but you know, what's interesting is hearing you talk about the way you are in a group and a crowd of people and it, you know, you almost tend you send you almost tend to say you, you hung back a little bit, right? And then and then to hear, you know, it's cool to see you talk about being out on the street, and then it's like you're establishing your presence, you know. It's, yeah, that is funny, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, but I I want to be better about it. that's actually that's that's some really good advice is, is 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 you know the establishing the corner thing. I'm gonna have to try that. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully we can get together in person, and I'll show you. I'll, I'll put yeah, you. Yeah, man. Out I'm there. gonna. Well, when's the next workshop? I'm coming out. Um, I don't have one scheduled right now, but uh, I'll have to take a look. I'll send you some info. Yeah, there are a couple. It'd be yeah. great, great. And even be if cool, we do a one on one, if you ever do a one on one, just just give me a holler if you're passing through LA. That'd be great. Thank you. Thanks again for joining me, and thanks to Matt for joining us on the Candor Frame. Find out more about Matt and his work by visiting mattk.com. Thank you for your continued support of The Candid Frame. If you haven't already, please take the time today to write a review in the iTunes store. Your ratings and comments help people to discover the great conversations like the one you heard today. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame, or you'll find a link in the show notes and The Candid Frame website. Or if you just want to make a one-time contribution to the show, you can do so via PayPal by clicking on the donate button on the Candid Frame website or in the show notes. Thanks to Chris Neoff for his recent contribution. It's very much appreciated. To access our complete archive of interviews, download the free Candid Frame app available for Apple iOS, Android, and Windows. It's the fastest and most convenient way to hear and save any of the great interviews we presented here at TCF. Links for each can be found in the show notes and the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at IbarianX. And this is IbarianX, and this is The Candid Frame. Thank you.